And hello, everyone. My name is Allison Dennis. I serve as the executive director for the Sitka Center for Art and Ecology. Welcome to this show and tell event featuring the work of five scientists and artists who are living and working in residence at the Sitka Center this spring. Spring 2020 through spring 2021 is Sitka's 50th anniversary year. We want to thank the Harold and Arlene Schnitzer Care Foundation and Jordan Schnitzer for their extraordinary signature sponsorship of Sitka's 50th anniversary year. Thank you. Thank you to our generous sponsors and foundations who make our work possible, including the James F. and Marion L. Miller Foundation, the Robert and Mercedes Eicholtz Foundation, Oregon Arts Commission, Oregon Cultural Trust, Explore Lincoln City, Framing Resource, Brian Potter Design, Park Lane Suites, and Siltstone Wines. We want to thank Sitka's founders, Jane and Frank Boyden, whose inspiration is perennial. 2020 and 2021 are not easy years to be a volunteer arts nonprofit board member. So thank you to current and outgoing board members, Peg, Barb, Dan, Dan, Greg, Joe, Ruth, Kristen, Alan, Jennifer, Elizabeth, Gail and Ryan, we are so grateful for your board service. You have one more opportunity to meet Sitka's residents this spring, our final show and tell event of the 2020-21 residency season is coming up on April 22nd at 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, so we hope you'll tune in for that. Tonight, for those of you who are participating live with us on Zoom, if you have questions or comments for our presenters, please do share them using the Q&A feature on your Zoom menu. Time permitting, I'll uh, read what you share and we'll do our best to fit in as many questions as possible, either just after people speak or uh, at the end of the presentation. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our first presenting resident, Paul Bordeaux, is a marine ecologist and associate professor at Humboldt State University. Paul and his students study how coastal marine organisms interact with their environment and respond to changing environmental conditions, particularly those brought about by human activities. Their approach combines field observations, manipulative laboratory and field experiments, and quantitative synthesis of published research. Paul teaches a variety of courses, including marine biology, invertebrate zoology, and plant-animal interactions. Here at the Sitka Center, he will be developing a new course on the visual display of scientific data. Paul is the first of two Sitka Howard L. McKee ecology residents sharing their work with you this afternoon. So as Paul gets ready to unmute his mic, Please join me in putting on a raucous display of human welcoming behavior loud enough for Paul to observe. Make some noise wherever you are and welcome Paul Bordeaux to Sitka. Okay, thank you, Allison, for that, that introduction. And I just wanna express my thanks to um, everyone for being here today. Um, and also my sincere thanks to the staff at Sitka for their tremendous hospitality. Uh, it's been an incredible time here so far. I've really enjoyed it and I've been recommending it to to many of my friends and colleagues. Um, I feel incredibly lucky to be here. Um, <laughs> as Allison mentioned, I'm from Humboldt State University. I teach marine biology and invertebrate zoology there, and I do marine ecological research. Humboldt State is part of the CSU system. It's the northernmost campus in that system, about seven hours from here. And although Allison mentioned what I'd be working on here at Sitka, the developing a new course on the visual display of scientific data. Ironically, I will be presenting almost no visual displays of scientific data um, in this talk, but instead sort of decided to focus um, on what my research program has been at Humboldt State and, and some of the, the papers that I've been writing as well um, here at Sitka. Uh, so, as an ecologist, I sort of view the fundamental goal of ecology as understanding how uh, organisms interact with their environment um, with the ultimate outcome that we'll use that information to better conserve and manage our valuable natural resources here uh, on our home planet. Um, and 
as with most of life, uh, the one constant in an organism's environment is change. Um, whether that be changes in temperature, precipitation associated with seasons, or changes in environmental conditions across altitudinal or latitudinal gradients, um, environmental change is really the norm of nature. And so as an ecologist, we're trying to understand how organisms um, interact with their changing environments. And I think that goal really comes into focus today and sort of takes on a new sense of urgency um, as humans are changing our environment uh, at unprecedented rates uh, through the introduction of non-native species like the zebra mussels you see here that are aquatic nuisance species in the Great Lakes and other waterways in the US. The reemergence of infectious diseases like the sea star wasting disease you see here um, in this ochre sea star that swept the West Coast, over harvesting of, of resources, particularly those in our oceans and global climate change as well. <clears throat> One of the things that my lab and I are really interested in is understanding how um, human-induced environmental change affects what we call foundation species. And, and we can think of foundation species as species in an ecosystem that really have large impacts um, on the ecosystem. They, they really influence local and regional biodiversity. They have big impacts on ecosystem processes and dynamics. Um, and they really have intrinsic value as well for the people that live near and around those species. And without those, ecos uh, those foundation species, ecosystems and the diversity that, that uh, exists within them tend to collapse. So you can think of some examples like redwood trees or even Sitka spruce that we see here um, on the coast of Oregon as these foundation species that create habitat, provide food, um, uh, thus promoting biodiversity in a particular area. What we're really focused on right now in terms of the human-induced environmental change that might be affecting these species um, is something called ocean acidification, uh, aka OA, and as some like to call it, the other carbon dioxide problem. Um, and ocean acidification sort of broadly refers to the chemical changes in our world's oceans brought about by the emission of carbon dioxide into the Earth's atmosphere. Um, this has big impacts, direct effects on the acidity of our world's oceans. Uh, this is one of the few visual displays of scientific data I'll have in my talk here. But what you see is that as increasing carbon dioxide emissions continue, uh, that's the red line there in this, in this graph, um, you see that carbon dioxide in our world's oceans, that's the, the green points on this graph here, are also increasing. And that has the effect on the acidity of the ocean, decreasing the amount of hydrogen ions in the ocean, lowering pH, increasing acidity. <clears throat> You've all experienced what increasing carbon dioxide in a liquid medium does. It's basically the same process as carbonation um, in things like seltzer water and soda. Um, so what we're doing by continuing our combustion of fossil fuels and releasing CO2 uh, into the atmosphere, which is then absorbed by the ocean, is we're basically carbonating our world's oceans. And the oceans actually absorb about one third of the carbon dioxide that's emitted into the atmosphere. So without our oceans, we'd actually be in a lot worse shape than we are now in terms of global climate change. The problem is, is that has real consequences for the ocean. And basically what happens is as CO2 gets absorbed in the ocean, it forms carbonic acid. And that carbonic acid basically steals carbonate ions in the ocean that are needed by marine organisms to create their exoskeletons or shells. So things like clams, sea urchins, mussels, corals, for example. Um, without that carbonate in the, in the water, they have a much more difficult time producing and maintaining their shells, which are important for their, their livelihoods. <clears throat> so one particular example um, that's, that's recent and very close to home here is a study last year was published that showed um, that ocean acidification in the Pacific Northwest 
is actually causing the shells of Dungeness crabs to dissolve and erode. Um, it is also causing um, issues with their sensory systems. And as many of you may know, the Dungeness crab fishery is a huge commercial fishery here in the Pacific Northwest. And so as these baby crabs are affected by um, ocean acidification, it has potential not just ecological consequences, but also economic consequences for this region. And, and this example here of a negative effect of, of ocean acidification on a marine species is one of literally hundreds that have shown negative impacts on, on marine life of ocean acidification. Now, it's not all doom and gloom, however, for um, marine life and ocean acidification. And some recent research, including some of that coming out of my lab and, and some of my students' work, suggests that at least there's some glimmer of hope on the horizon um, for uh, marine life and their ability to respond and interact with changing environments in the ocean. <clears throat> And one of the things that we were particularly interested in and, and have been working on in recent years is looking at the effects of ocean acidification on the California mussel. Uh, the California mussel is a foundation species that provides habitat for literally hundreds of species um, on rocky shores from Alaska to Baja, California, and also provides food for species all the way from lobsters to humans. Um, so particularly important uh, species on the coast. And we can actually study the effects of ocean acidification on these mussels right here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, because along the coast of uh, the, the Pacific, um, there exists this mosaic or patchwork of this process called coastal upwelling. And we get a little bit technical here um, just to explain how this process works. Basically, as winds from the north um, come down the coast of, of Pacific North America, it pushes surface waters offshore. So those warm surface waters get pushed offshore. And because those waters need to be replaced, what they get replaced by is deeper nutrient-rich water that comes up from below to replace those surface waters. Now that deep water is nutrient rich, but it also happens to be very acidic and, and very low in oxygen. And in fact, along some parts of the Pacific coast, the water that gets upwelled every season between March and, and September can be as acidic or even more acidic as what we're predicting for global oceans 50 to 100 years from now. So we can sort of use this patchwork or mosaic of upwelling driven ocean acidification as a natural laboratory to study how ocean acidification might be affecting marine organisms right now in real time. Um, and so you can see here on this, this map on the left, um, sort of normal ocean water pH, which is a measure of acidity is usually around eight. And you can see as the, the spots on this map get down into the purple and pink, those are what we call ocean acidification hotspots. These are places where the upwelling is particularly intense. And then there are places where that's not the case. Uh, areas that are in, in green or yellow or red, those waters are more normal, more like a pH of eight. So the mussels that exist along the coast, some of them grow up in these ocean acidification hotspots and others don't. And so what we can do is we can go out into the field and actually individually mark mussels and determine what their growth rates are and what their um, shell deposition rates are in these different locations where ocean acidification is intense and where it's more mild. And we can see whether or not the ocean acidification in nature is actually affecting these mussels. We can also bring this, the baby mussels back into the lab grow them under similar and variable conditions in the laboratory, different levels of ocean acidification stress, different levels of food, and see how that affects their growth and shell deposition. <clears throat> and what we expected to find um, based on just first principles, but also what other scientists in Southern California were finding is that ocean acidification, exposure to this upwelling driven ac acidification would actually cause trouble for these mussels, make it difficult for them to grow, make it difficult for them to produce and maintain their shells. But what we actually found was the exact opposite of that. That is the mussels that grew up in these ocean acidification hotspots actually grew faster and made thicker, stronger shells 
than muscles from outside those ocean acidification hotspots. And in fact, when we brought those muscles into the lab and grew them under um, common garden conditions, the muscles from those hotspot areas continue to grow faster and make stronger shells than those from outside the spot. So this is completely opposite of what we expected. And what, we, what we've hypothesized and found some evidence for is that food really matters. You remember maybe that that upwelling doesn't just bring acidic water toward the coast where the mussels experience it, it's also full of nutrients and so provides the mussels with lots of food. And so food really matters. If the mussels are fed well enough, if they have enough resources and have enough energy, they can combat the stress of ocean acidification just fine. Not only that, but it seems to be that where the mussels come from matters as well. So mussels from these OA hotspots seem to be pre-adapted to dealing with ocean acidification stress, perhaps because of their long history of exposure to these conditions. So some hope there on the mussel front. One other thing I just wanna talk about is we're also interested in how some species may actually make it easier for other species in the context of ocean acidification may alleviate the stress of ocean acidification for other species. And people have long speculated that submerged aquatic vegetation, things like kelps and seagrasses, might be able to alleviate ocean acidification stress on other species through the process of photosynthesis. And that's because during the process of photosynthesis, plants take up carbon dioxide and then convert that into sugar. And what that does in the surrounding seawater potentially is lower the acidity of the seawater, increase oxygen, and make carbonate more available for marine organisms to build their shells. So we wanted to see under what conditions and how much kelp might actually be able to create refugia from ocean acidification stress for other marine organisms. So what we did is we put these sensor arrays in different environments inside the kelp, like you see here at the surface and at the ocean floor, and then also outside of the kelp. And we measure things like ocean pH and dissolved oxygen to see whether or not there's a spatial effect of the kelp on the local seawater on these chemical variables to see if kelp is potentially changing the chemical conditions in a way that might be beneficial for other marine organisms. And what we found in fact is that in the kelp canopy up near the surface where light is abundant and photosynthesis can happen relatively um, efficiently, the seawater is in fact less acidic and there's more oxygen and more carbonate in the water, at least during the day. And what that suggests in the good news here is that maybe kelp could serve as an OA oasis for canopy dwelling organisms like baby rockfish, juvenile sea, uh, sea urchins and other animals that live within that canopy environment. But we should caution that those effects um, did not extend beyond the canopy. So just outside of the kelp and nearby urchin barrens, we don't see an effect at the surface water and we don't see an effect on the ocean floor. So the, the beneficial effects of photosynthesis by kelp might be limited just to the upper reaches of the ocean um, near the surface where the canopy is, and also only during the day when photosynthesis is happening and during the growing season of the kelp in the summertime. So I just wanted to share um, those two bits of, of research that my lab and I have been working on. I'm, I'm writing up those papers right now as I reside here at SIPCA. Um, and I hopefully offer a glimmer of hope for some ways that marine life may be able to exist in the future under the change of ocean acidification. And again, thanks for your attention and for being here for my talk. Thank you so much, Paul. Really appreciate you sharing your research. And if people have questions for Paul or other residents as we go along, feel free to use the Q&A feature and we'll weave them into the talk and hopefully save some time at the end. Okay. Currently based in Oregon, Genevieve Ray Busby creates work that explores the interconnectedness of our material world, both natural and human made. Throughout her practice, she insists on the importance of examining the everyday things that populate our world, of considering the strange agency of objects and our fraught but also delightful uh, relationships with material objects. Caught in delicate gouache strokes, suspended in resin, her objects and paintings bring the stuff 
of our frenetic contemporary world into focus, offering opportunity for critical reflection and wonder. Originally from a small farm in rural Kansas, she has shown work in shows in Providence, Rhode Island, Lawrence, Kansas, Mexico City, and the Bay Area, and recently received her MFA from Mills College. As Genevieve gets ready uh, to unmute her mic, please make some joyful noise and help me welcome Genevieve Ray Busby to Sitka. Thank you for that introduction, Allison. It's lovely to be here. Um, I am going to begin by briefly introducing myself and work and then slide into my experience at SIP. I'm firstly a painter, secondly a resourceful artist using whatever medium or technique the work calls for, and thirdly an amateur anthropologist. Debris and human castoffs are some of my prime materials and muses. And I make work that straddles notions of the natural and manufactured or human made. Here are bits of LCD screen and LCD standing for liquid crystal display, cast into crystalline forms that recall the same minerals mined to make the technology in the first place. I am simultaneously in awe of human generativity and output, and also deeply concerned by our propensity for destruction and waste. And this collection of once technological devices, now crystalline forms, found a final form in a book that documents their stories. Recently, I have been working with tidal debris, plastics, and other objects brought in by the tide. Late um, 2019, not long before the pandemic, I started a series of paintings of balls I had collected on the shoreline. All of these were painted on maritime maps that corresponded to the long journeys that these objects had traveled from their inception or manufacture in mostly China and Southeast Asia, all the way to the Oakland Bay. I cannot recall the exact number of balls I have collected and painted in total, but it is now close to a hundred. And each of these humble balls has already seen so much more of the world than I have and also likely many of the viewers, um, and in addition to that, will outlive us all by centuries. While here I've been finishing this project as it was interrupted along with countless other projects, jobs, plans, and ways of life, um, thanks to the pandemic. And on that note, I am incredibly grateful for the opportunities that this residency has given me, which is a difficult time for so many. So now here at Sitka in the marshes, in the mouth of the Salmon River, I received quite a warm and appropriate welcome here from another well-traveled ball. I'm not sure how it got into the marsh and certainly doesn't bounce well there. So on um, to my time here at Sitka. Wandering through the moss-clad hillside up here in late February, I have been immersed, immersed in a lush decadence. There are life forms on every surface in all states of decay, biodegrading into new forms. And here it is that I begin to doubt the laws of entropy. I, there is no loss, only fecundity. The word that comes to mind for me is decadence, which the, um, the roots of that are in French and medieval Latin from decay, which in turn comes from something coming apart or falling apart. And in addition to moral artistic decline and deterioration, it also invokes excess luxury and indulgence, death, vice, all very negative. But here at Sitka, I am in awe of this very lively and um, amazing decadence like here on this tiny uh, branch, which is functioning as sort of a mini nurse log. I, as an artist, am painting it and I can't even see, let alone represent with a brush, all of the minutia of life that's going on. So I'm seeing perpetual decay as perpetual life and decadence and loss as generative gifts. It's very Buddhist. And also decadent rocks and decadent trees. 
Um, and then a lot of the time I spent here was walking along the local paths and roadways. This particular road is on the way to the highway. And the roadside to me presents a unique sliver of land, a space undefined by one particular owner or use, often overlooked, taken for granted. Um, it's a familiar borderland and it is a truly public space. Beer cans and cigarette butts intermingle with utility lines, berry briars, nettles, leaning alders, and sweet wild strawberry. I spent quite a bit of time also collecting along the roadway um, as debris and human trash is the stuff of anthropologists' dreams. <laughs> It paints a, a very accurate portrait of the people who live here. So in my collection here, I see quite an array of demographics, kind of recalling how the roadside is a very democratic and public place. Some of them identify with more with than others. And a few that I was particularly into are the Coors Banquet, uh, brewed with 100% Rocky Mountain water, floating in the stream, about to make its way all the way to the Pacific Ocean before I snatched it up. And also this peach chiller, which I found sort of perched on the grassy side of the road. And it actually had formed its own terrarium. That's a tiny bit of miner's lettuce that I don't know how the seed got in there, but um, it is now coming home with me as a new terrarium for my house. So along these walks and sometimes amongst the cans and trash itself, an unmistakable natural beauty really caught my eye. It was popping up abundantly and indiscriminately a true populist bloom, skunk cabbage. So here it is. Um, here, here they are bathing under a roadside drain and rising up from the mossy base of a tree. I don't even see any mud. I at first found the smell to be quite lovely and pleasant and was rather perplexed, but given it a few days to mature in its flowering cycle, the smell changed dramatically and I understood why it gets its name. And in that picture, um, from a picture, you could see the different stages. It's also a um, immodest, incredibly out there, uh, dramatic, um, I would even say like kind of brash and, and um, yeah, immodest plant, much like the common debris on the roadside. And I started to draw some correlations there. I felt like they made a really nice pair. So I have begun a series, a new series, I'm very into series, um, with this few studies um, of paintings for the sensual, the common, the of here, and the at times unpleasant. While here, um, I have also been spending some time gathering microplastics for future work probably sculptural. Here, kayaks and barnacles have collaborated to make these really lovely bedazzled barnacles. And over the past month, I've tried to learn from, from this place about decadence, about living with larger and often destructive forces and about falling and coming apart even with beauty and joy. Robin Wall Kimmerer, writes, even a wounded world is feeding us. Even a wounded world holds us, giving us moments of wonder and joy. I choose joy over despair, not because I have my head in the sand, but because joy is what the earth gives me daily and I must return that gift. And I feel similarly about decadence and about her sentiments with the unnatural world, the world of man's creations. It has its moments of wonder and joy. And when I attune more to those and to the power of our collective knowledge and our immense creativity, I find hope. Um, I find and I believe that when we truly value human ingenuity and labor and our own technologies, we will not be so quick to let our incredible creations 
become waste. So I wanted to end with um, a moment of gratitude for the past and present and future stewards of the Sitka place, the land here. And also with my favorite find that I am very much looking forward to both wearing and painting. So thank you everyone. Thank you, Genevieve, and thank you for the Robin Wall camera quote. She's also a past Sitka resident, so something the two of you have in common now. All right. Lisa Conway grew up outside Detroit, Michigan. She received her MFA in ceramics from Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge and her BFA in ceramics from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. She has completed numerous artist residencies, including working at the Archie Bray Foundation, Anderson Ranch Art Center, Watershed Center for the Ceramic Arts, and the Skohegan School of Painting and Sculpture in Maine. Lisa has previously taught ceramics at the University of Alaska in Anchorage and the Alberta College of Art and Design in Calgary. She is currently a professor of art and head of the ceramics area at Clark College in Vancouver, Washington where she has taught since 2003. Lisa lives in Portland, Oregon, where she shares a home studio with her husband. And as Lisa gets ready to share, Sitka community, please make some more noise and help me welcome Lisa Conway to the Sitka Center. Thank you. Thank you, Allison, um, for the intro. I wanna start by thanking all of the Sitka staff here that I've met and haven't met. Um, I have only been at Sitka for two days. And so I'm still in my um, honeymoon period <laughs> and amazed um, with the beauty of the area. And I'm just really tickled to be here. Um, the studio is big and beautiful, and I look forward to making a lot of work while I'm here for this month. Uh, but of course, what I'm gonna show in these slides are all um, past pieces of mine and talk a little bit about that work. Um, it's very common for me to take um, natural objects from outside and bring them into the studio look at them on a micro level and blow them up into my pieces and make pieces from them, um, exploring the detail world of natural objects and exaggerating them, abstracting them. And through that process, inventing my own particular vocabulary of forms and shapes and surfaces. Um, I also choose to work with my pieces in the vessel format, which is natural with ceramics to make pieces that are vessels. But with my pieces in particular, it's helpful in creating a contrast between the inside and the outside and using that as a metaphor for talking about the human condition and exposing part of our own interior emotional landscape to others. Oh, I'm having trouble forwarding, here we go. Um, some common plants that I've taken from and worked with over the years include succulent plants, uh, which are very abundant around here. And I'm particularly interested in the way that they grow in the way that they grow by often splitting apart in the unique forms that are created in the way that they hold water inside their particularly interesting skins in the way they swell and expand and sometimes seem to burst open. This piece is about two feet across and it's a vessel made of individual components that are all hollow walled. Um, most of my pieces are either built from separate components joined together or sometimes built from the table surface coming up with a coil or pinching method. I 
I play with textures a lot, again, in contrasting areas from very smooth to textures that I think are more exciting or um, um, carry the eye around the form. I look at different types of fruit and how they open up um, and take my form vocabulary from a lot of different objects so that they don't um, become siloed into particularly referencing any one type of natural form because ultimately I'm not a scientist, I'm not a botanist and uh, instead, I want my pieces to talk about the human condition. And so I like to have a level of abstraction in my work that allows the viewer to insert something of themselves in there. I also really um, try to bring a sense of the human anatomy into my pieces. Um, so you might see forms and shapes in here that reference human body parts. But again, I don't want them to reference them too specifically um, because I want my work to be more suggestive than that. There are certain um, states of human um, physicality that I try and bring out in my work, but it's more about the emotional qualities of those states of physicality. So I might try and bring about a certain tension in my pieces, um, but also a sense of gravity, a sense of um, perhaps sagging in them, but also uh, my pieces might look erect or deflated or blushing or ticklish or tender or reaching out. I, I want to bring out these associations in my pieces and to have them have a direct or to enact a direct physical response from the viewer. I'm interested in bringing about a sense of growth through my work um, and sharing that process of growing or becoming as reflected in nature um, through ourselves with each other. So I try and capture that sense of becoming growth development in my pieces and sharing that with the viewer. This is an example of a piece that's just built from the table surface um, coming up, uh, built by hand. It's about 18 inches across. And again, using the inside versus outside contrast to bring about perhaps a sense of vulnerability in the work, but also a sense of the growth potential in it. A sense of reaching or yearning perhaps. I want my pieces to have the quality of how a plant may grow in a certain direction towards the sun and reach in that direction. And I feel in some ways, I, I use that as a metaphor to talk about sexuality in my work. I feel like plants growing towards the sun, we lean in towards each other um, in a sexual and sensual way often and I want my pieces to reference that sense of growth and attraction that we all feel on a fundamental level. For the oh, one last um, pedestal piece here, this one is a more uh, deconstructed vessel form. But for the past several years, I've also been experimenting with these light pieces. Uh, this, this series of work, um, I've done several iterations of over the years, they keep developing. Um, these pieces are made of high fire porcelain. 
Um, there's a special technique I've worked with over the years of spraying a porcelain slip over balloon forms and getting a very thin wall that um, light can project through as the clay is translucent. So here you see the piece turned on and turned off. They're wall mounted with um, custom mounting brackets and there's an LED light on the inside. And I was very taken with how the glaze surface changed when the light was turned on. And it seems to literally give the piece a sense of life and growth from the inside and really opened up a new form vocabulary for me. So these pieces are made with um, separate parts that I then join together, the, the porcelain forms. And I have an installation shot here from the last gallery show I had in Portland about a year ago, well, right before the shutdown. And a detail shot of some of the glaze surface. Um, while I'm here at Sika, I plan on doing a lot of exploring outside. I haven't had much time to do that yet. Um, and um, expanding my form vocabulary. Uh, I don't know that I'll do much glazing while I'm here, but I plan on doing a lot of building. Uh, most of my pieces are glaze fired five to 10 times each. So that can be a rather labor intensive process that I plan on completing once I get back home. But I'm really looking forward to making some new work while I'm here. And this is my last slide. Thank you, Lisa. Keep your microphone on. I have uh, just a, uh, there's a comment. Um, Lisa, I love your forms and that you delineate between interior and, exter and exterior. And then a question from Linda. Lisa, where do you show in Portland? I would love to see your work. Oh, thank you. Um, the gallery is called Eutectic. Um, that's spelled E-U-T-E-C-T-I-C, -E -T -T Eutectic. Um, and they are, well, right now they are on the web. Um, they have not reopened to the public yet, but they do exist in Northeast Portland. Thank you. Yeah, great. Okay. Kurt Bausch is Professor Emeritus in the Department of Fish, Wildlife, and Conservation Biology at Colorado State University, where he taught for 35 years. His research collaborations in stream fish ecology and conservation have taken him throughout Colorado and the West and worldwide, including to Hokkaido in Northern Japan. His experiences were chronicled in the PBS documentary, River Webs, and the 2015 book, For the Love of Rivers, A Scientist's Journey, which won the Sigurd F. Olson Nature Writing Award. He has received Lifetime Achievement Awards from the American Fisheries Society and the World Council of Fisheries Societies, and the Leopold Conservation Award from Fly Fishers International. This year, Kurt was awarded one of two Sitka Howard L. McKee Ecology Residencies. Kurt is also a returning Sitka resident and we are thrilled to have him back with us. So as Kurt gets ready to share wherever you are, please join me in welcoming Kurt Bausch back to the Sitka Center. Well, thank you very much, Allison. It's um, a real pleasure to come back again. It's something I think all residents want to do. And uh, certainly my residency uh, now a decade ago was incredibly important to the book that I wrote then and uh, informing some of the ideas that I have. I'd also, um, like to thank all the supporters for making these residencies possible. And I should also note uh, that many of these images I'll show are come from a nonprofit called Freshwaters Illustrated, which is in Corvallis. It's um, the work of Jeremy Monroe and Dave Harasimchuk, such as this image here. So my approach at the end of my academic career was to try to draw people into the world of rivers and streams and show why they're essential to people uh, beyond water to drink and fish to catch even and so on. And so that's what I wanted to do when I came before and I found it really inspiring to interact with uh, visual artists and other 
writers and try to become a different kind of writer than I had been as a scientist. Truly, my story is, is that all I really wanted to be was a fish biologist when I started and do the kind of work that would help um, others protect habitat for fish and streams and, and protect against some of the human effects. Uh, grad school was certainly a blast. Uh, this is a long time ago, but this is the kind of work that you get to do. This is at Michigan. And then as a professor, when I came to Colorado, I had the opportunity to work in beautiful places like this and study uh, the native trout of the West, which are cutthroat trout, um, and to try to understand how to conserve these fish. Um, we also worked out on the plains of Eastern Colorado, where streams are very dry and stop flowing sometimes. Uh, but again, there are beautiful native fishes there. This is one of the small members of the perch family. They're called darters that live here in the Arikari River in Eastern Colorado, almost to the border of Kansas. And I was also fortunate, as Alan, Allison said, to go to Northern Japan. I met this young man uh, who's on the left here, Shigeru Nakano, worked on the native char in the mountains of of uh, Hokkaido Island in Northern Japan in the 90s and 2000s. But as um, our, one of our most famous conservationists, Aldo Leopold wrote, ecologists live alone in a world of wounds. And that is the systems that you work on, the intertidal that Paul works on, for example, probably none of us go down to the shore and think about ocean acidification or none of us other than people like Paul, of course, because we don't see the acid in the ocean. But when we look at streams all around the world, streams have been channelized, they've been straightened, they have barriers in them so that fish and other organisms can't get to the places that they need to complete their life cycles. Um, and th this is a stream in central Japan. You can see that not even humans can get down to interact with this waterway. And so you might contrast this. This is another Japanese stream you can see there's a natural riparian zone along the stream. Uh, even though there are humans in this landscape, you can see the bridge upstream. Um, this allows the insects emerging from streams to feed the birds and bats and lizards and spiders that live along in these, these riparian zones, as well as all the insects that are living in the trees to fall into streams and feed fish. And this is some of what my colleague Nakano in Japan studied in great detail. Out on the Great Plains, this is an aerial Google Earth image showing how much water we pump out of the ground. Every one of those crop circles is a quarter of a mile to a mile across. And what you're looking at are the green watershed boundaries for this Arikari River flowing from left to right. Um, and we're basically pumping this river dry. So even in May, the blue lines show where the river is flowing, but the red lines show where it's completely dry. And if we fast forward to the dry part of the summer, you can see that the river is, is drying up every summer. And uh, we did a lot of research to show how soon it will be before this is gone. And the 16 native fish species that live here will be lost from this river, for example. So we as humans are, are, are doing these things. And um, near the end of my career, then I, I was pondering this question about why would people want to conserve rivers? You spend a career trying to answer questions to help managers turn the dials and conserve rivers, but obviously it's the rest of us who have to make those decisions in the way we vote and what we ask for. So, of course, understanding the science of fish biology is important, but people don't respond to the sort of cerebral arguments that we scientists are used to telling each other. They respond um, instead to matters of the heart, really. And so two things through thinking about this and writing about this became clear to me. First is that we humans need something far more from rivers than just water to drink and grow crops and fish to catch. And this has to do with the wholeness and resilience that we seek from these places the coolness that we find in the riparian on a hot summer day and the mists rising from bends on crisp fall mornings. It has to do 
with the fish and the other animals that you find there that are so well adapted to this relentless pull of the flow that is ever seeking the oceans and the flow of insects that flows from the riparian into the stream and from the river out into these landscapes. So in short, as I said, it has to do with this matter of the heart and the reverence we have for these places that offer the murmuring, wilting half voices that can calm for us the inner half voices of doubt and fear that haunt our souls. And so this is what I wrote about in this book that I uh, wrote part of here at Sitka that Allison mentioned. Um, if you're interested in it, there's a website, there's little short videos uh, about the themes of the book. And so the second thing then in, in thinking about it after this book was published and giving talks about it and people asking me if I was going to write again, I realized that um, we're going to need an ethic for rivers to guide us when seeking this wholeness and resilience of something that's so essential, not only to fish and other aquatic organisms and birds and bats along the streams, but also to us as humans. And so that's why I've come to Sitka uh, is to work on parts of the second book to try to connect people to rivers and attempt to articulate this ethic and ethic for our evolving relationship to them. And again, harking back to all the Leopold who wrote this from work he did in the 1920s and 30s, this is the sort of idea and feeling that most scientists don't ever try to approach, but um, Leopold was one. He wrote that the good life on any river may likewise depend on the perception of its music and the preservation of some music to perceive is a form of doubt not yet entertained by science. So my goal is to try to get to this productive and yet difficult interface between really the science and the humanities. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt, and welcome back. Uh, we've got a few questions um, coming in, one for uh, Paul, a couple for uh, Lisa, a comment for Kurt. I'll share those uh, at the end after our last presenter. So uh, please stay tuned for some Q&A. Okay, we've got one more presentation. Meg Ojala combines large scale landscape photographs, drawings and text to imbue her subjects such as a river or a bog with a sense of agency. She employs ambiguous spatial illusions, disorienting points of view, and a bewildering sense of scale to shift the perception of the viewer and to elicit empathy for the natural world. Meg is a professor emerita of art and art history at St. Olaf College, and she received her BA from the University of Minnesota and her MFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. She is a recipient of McKnight Foundation Artist Fellowships for Photographers, Minnesota State Arts Board Artist Initiative Grants, and a grant from the Southeastern Minnesota Arts Council. Ojala has exhibited nationally and internationally and is represented by Groveland Gallery in Minneapolis. She lives and works in Dundas, Minnesota. As Meg gets her mic ready, please join me in giving Meg Ojala a warm Sitka community welcome. Thank you, Allison, for that introduction. Hello, everyone, and thank you for being here. I also want to thank uh, the staff at Sitka, um, Tamara and Nicola and Bob, I saw in person, and uh, they, they helped me in various ways at various times, and I'm really grateful. Um, and for the staff members who I didn't meet who are working behind the scenes, um, and I'm so grateful to the founders of Sitka, and I wanted to express that and thanks to the, all the hard work that the board does and the support of various donors. And um, I just have appreciated my time at Sitka so much. What I'm going to do right now is, is read a short introduction. And while I do that, I'm going to share uh, a video of a, of a book that I made while I was at Sitka. It's, it's a work in progress. It's, it's a first draft of a sort of prototype. Um, I made the prints in, on the laser printer in the office. I put the prints, taped the prints into a, a found sketchbook, a sketchbook that I, that I brought that served the purpose of, of um, providing pages for sequencing the book. When I was leaving for Oregon, 
I told a friend, I want to be really organized and have everything I need so I can hit the ground running. She wisely responded, why would you want to do that? And when I arrived and Tamara was orienting me and explaining the recycling, which I'll never completely understand, and giving my key, me my key, she said, you are here. Let this place seep in. I took that to heart. I looked, I sat on the bench in the meadow above the estuary, watched the tidal flow, walked, paddled, photographed. I didn't work as much as I played in the studio, drawing and experimenting. I jotted down thoughts and descriptions in the warmth at the little desk halfway up the stairs in Morley House. Sitka sits on the very edge of this continent. One can see the Pacific Ocean and hear its roar. It is in a temperate rainforest of alders, Sitka spruce, and Douglas fir that are thickened and draped with mosses and lichens. It is tucked under the beautiful open upland prairie of Cascade Head. It is just above a wide estuary where the Salmon River picks up speed as it flows out around the sand pit into the sea. And where the ocean saltwater floods upriver with the tide as far as the town of Otis. Add wind, add rain, add all the sounds, the chipping of river otters, the slapping of beaver tails, bird calls, wind, rain. <laughs> it's complicated. It's incomprehensible, overwhelming. There are no clear margins, no boundaries. It is like a threshold, a liminal space. At Sitka, it is impossible to sort out what is exactly what, as salty wind and inland air swirls, fresh water flows out, salt water surges in, earth slides, trees fall, and in another season, add fire and smoke. Not to mention the geology, inevitable earthquake and tsunami and ocean rising with the ice melt. What a catastrophe and what a wonder. Like a living being, this place should not be defined, possessed, or used. The estuary is a sentient being with agency. It is a place to be uncertain, to remain open and curious and even anxious. It is mind bending, untranslatable, and enlivening. I don't want to reduce it. I'd like my sense of it to remain as Anne Carson in her essay, Variations on the Right to Remain Silent, which is kind of a rage against the cliche. Um, she writes, in the moment before something becomes something else, before it falls into place in a form, and is locked to it. But here I go, I want to explore this place. What is there? <clears throat> what is there? <laughs> what is it like? I want to research and understand estuaries, the natural history, cultural history, hydrology, biology, and make an installation and a book that will convey my sense of this complicated swirling place. What a contradiction. Keep it fluid, but make an image, make a book. It is like this, or perhaps it is a paradox. And the work can be both an image, have form and remain open. This, I'm, I'm going to share, uh, I'm going to talk you through the book a little bit or what I'm intending to do here. Um, and this first image is, is from a drawing that, I, or it's a photograph of a drawing I did in the studio. Um, the studio has a wonderful big utility sink that's a big tub. And I had a great time with um, charcoal and ink and paper and water. And um, 
imagining the estuary in, in a sort of abstract form of drawing. The, the idea for this book is that it will kind of take, take, you, take you along with my exploration of the place. When I got to Sitka, it was, it was dark and it was raining, pelting rain and wind. And, um, and so I explored the, the sort of areas right around um, Sitka. And this is a little tiny fragment of the experience. Um, I have I have pictures of interior spaces um, with the the you know the salty water that's that's dripping down the, the windows and um, this is another image that I made in this this is actually from the utility sink this image on the right <laughs> but it's my my estuary And this is exploring the, the higher elevations, the incredibly huge tip overs and roots and masses of mosses and lichens. And in a book, you know, we have, if you can imagine this as a book and these as pages that are facing each other, um, the, the juxtaposition of different images is what I'm, I'm going to be working on. What to put next to what, what to um, compare to what uh, on, the, on the pages. This is getting me closer to the estuary now. I, you could see the estuary through the trees. This is exploring up on Grassy Mountain and going down to the lower elevations. One of the ideas for this book is that is that the ocean is there. It's it, the impact the ocean has on this ecosystem is huge, but it's a little bit elusive. It's, you can see it off in the distance. You can get to it only by watching for the low, low tide or the negative tide, and then taking, the, taking a, a kayak across the river and walking around the spit to actually be on the beach. Um, so this, this book takes you closer and closer to that. And I, I want to figure out how to give a sense of its presence without necessarily showing it. So this is moving down through the meadows. And the, the photograph on the, on the left is from a, from a paint, like an a inkjet print that is on canvas of an aerial view of the Salmon River as it flows into the, the ocean. And on the right, the, the estuary, the flooded marsh. I made various, I did various experiments in the studio with inks and, and moving the paper to, to, to sort of mimic the flow of the, of the salt water coming in and the fresh water moving out and, and um, trying to describe the way the, the Salmon River moves. And here's some play with... So Paul, <laughs> we have a visual display of <laughs> what might be salt water and fresh water mingling in the estuary. Another thing that really struck me, well, what struck me most when I got there is, is the intensity of the, the weather and the movement and the power and the force of it. And landslides became more interesting to me than I expected them to be. There's you know, small ones and large ones, but I want the drawings to give some sense of that, that motion, the weather, the movement. Um, the movement in and out of the estuary. This is a small little tributary that is too small to go into with my kayak. Um, this is a LIDAR map of, the, of the, uh, the Salmon River estuary. So now I'm actually kayaking on the estuary and trying to get a sense of it. It's hard to get a sense of a, a huge space like that from within it um, and combining that with, 
what might look more like aerial views of the of the place. Here we're down at the boat launch, um, right at the mouth of the Salmon River. You can see the waves of the ocean coming in and crashing against the cliffs at Cascade Head. And this can give you a sense of the of all this, all of these forces that are mingling here. The wind is blowing the river in one direction. The current is pulling it in another. The ocean is coming in and the tide is surging in another direction. And it's, you know, blown by the wind. The, this is, this is, and this is another completely different experience of the same place. This is on the Salmon River here on the left, and this is where you can see the barnacles. You can you can see evidence of the salt water and its in, its influence. I'm getting out to the out to the beach. And I was really debating actually about whether to put a picture of the ocean in this in this sequence of pictures. I did do that today, I indulged. <laughs> and, and here's a picture of the, the ocean. And then I think you know, a really uh, important aspect of my experience was all the sounds. And, and, a, and a, unfortunately a photo book, it can have text, but it can't have sound, it's silent. And I'd like to suggest the sound. And so I'm thinking about having a page, a final page that the, that the reader will get to at the very end. And it will say with sounds, it is like this with sounds. And then and it, maybe they'll be encouraged to page back through and um, imagine the, the sounds that they might hear. Um, one one thing I just want to say that I that I took away with me um, is is the practice of working day after day, letting the place seep in, um, not worrying or trying not to worry at all about the outcome, the hard copy. I mean, it's really good practice and so revi revitalizing. Um, I think it was a really pivotal experience for me because I will always be able to be reminded um, that that way of working, that way of making is always accessible to me, even when I'm not at Sitka. So thank you very much for your attention and for that experience. Thank you so much, Meg. I have uh, some comments for Meg and then a, a few other questions and comments. Uh, the first comment is from your fellow resident, uh, Lisa Conway, who writes, oh, Meg, your words and photos are so beautiful. Thank you for deepening my appreciation of this place. Mm -hmm. This is the last time I will serve as an intermediary for the two of you. You need to <laughs> talk directly together. Uh, Jill writes, Meg, brava, wonderful to see what you are doing. And of course, your words are poetic and full of questions. Everyone, wonderful presentations I am learning so much. And Jean writes, Meg, you are a great explorer. Got a question for Paul. Uh, Paul, it is, uh, this is uh, from Janet Morrison, who's a recent uh, uh, Sitka resident. Paul, it was so fun when your results are opposite to your hypothesis. Your research is fascinating. Thank you for sharing it. Can you also say a little about the new course you are planning on data visualizations? Janet, thanks for the question and, and agreed. Uh, things that are unexpected are the, the most um, fascinating and frustrating things in, in science. Um, as far as the course goes, uh, with, with a month left in my residency, I have to say there's, there's not been a lot done quite yet, um, but I still got some time. Um, but the idea is to create a graduate seminar based on some of the fundamental principles of Edward Tufte and his book, The Scientific Display uh, or the Visual Display of Scientific Data, and then merging that with some more modern ideas um, 
by Klaus Wilke, who has written a book called The Fundamentals of Data Visualization, um, sort of combining those two things and having students apply that using the programming language R to create uh, data graphics. Lisa, if you want to uh, find your mic, I have uh, a couple questions for you. Uh, one person wrote in to ask about uh, the diameter of the light globe. Can you please illuminate? <laughs> yes, uh, they, the pieces I showed range in size. They're, they're, the light pieces are about in the 12 to 14 inch range um, um, as projecting off of the wall about 12 inches high. Um, yeah, about that range. And then uh, Lisa Talmadge uh, also uh, wrote in to say that she so enjoyed your talk and your voluptuous work. Looking forward to meeting you in a couple of days at Thank Sitka. You. Thank you. And then uh, Kurt have uh, a couple of comments. Uh, the first one's from Bruce Byers, a former uh, uh, Sika, uh Howard L. McKee ecology resident. Thank you for your book, For the Love of Rivers. It was an honor to follow you to an ecology residency at Sitka, which catalyzed my own uh, book. So uh, uh, from one, one ecology resident to another, thanks uh, Bruce to Kurt. And then Kurt, uh, this is from Jean, your goal to connect people to rivers is so essential to engage in activism for conservation. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. And uh, for Bruce, I haven't had a chance up till now to read your book, but I just received it. So I'm looking forward to reading it and uh, maybe we can communicate a little bit. Thanks. And then uh, a few more uh, comments people is responding to uh, Meg's work that she just uh, shared incredible photos, Meg. I feel like I have a look into your month at Sitka. Can't wait to see the finished book. Uh, uh, but that aside comment uh, that they kind of like it the way it is now. <laughs> and then thank you so much for these wonderful presentations as a follow-up to Meg's fabulous book. Could Sitka reach out to musicians who could create accompanying music, even digital versions? What a great uh, idea. And if you are out there, uh, a Sitka musician listening in, uh, if you've got ideas to collaborate, let us know. There's a question uh, from Linda who asks if we will be able to see this presentation at another time to have science colleagues who also do art who would love it. And the answer is yes, it has a YouTube channel. It usually takes us about 24 hours to just clean up uh, the, the live video from tonight and get it posted on YouTube. But you can find this and all of the other past uh, uh, Sika show and tells from our residents from this past year, uh, as, as well as the other talks that we did this year. And uh, we'll close with this comment. This is a, a thank you from Uda. Thank you so much for these wonderful presentations. Thank you to Meg, Kurt, Lisa, Genevieve, and Paul for sharing your work with us today. Thank you Sika community for tuning in and celebrating Sika's residents and for all the ways you support artists and scientists and the creation of new work. We hope you will join us on April 22nd for the last resident show and tell of the season. From everyone at Sitka, wherever you are, we wish you a good evening from the Oregon coast. Good night, everybody.